Welcome to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. I'm Sean Finder, and I'm with my host, Ollie Wigfield. This show is brought to you by Autoclose, a vanilla soft company. Ollie, we don't have a guest today, but why don't you uh, tell the audience what we're going to be talking about? Before we do that, how did you just pronounce my name? Say that again for me. Ollie Wigfield. Okay, right. It, it sounded something different to me, but it's probably just my old headphones. All right, yeah. So you remember a couple of weeks ago we did a webinar and um, we had to talk about the cold email fatal conversion killers. I thought bring that to the podcast, but maybe we'll do. Um, we had a few technical difficulties on the webinar. Let's just say that. So uh, we could probably get through it in half the time um, with half of the trouble and half of the heart rate going up and down. So. Um, do you remember the points is the first question, or do I have to read them from my Slack on my right-hand page? I would probably read them from your Slack. I mean, I have the points in my head that I know are the answers, but I'd love to hear if they actually match up with what we talked about a few weeks ago. All right, well, let's off the cuff at them. What, what comes to your mind first? So the first thing that comes is not, not using a call to action. No call to action in the sales email. Okay, yeah. Um, oftentimes what I would say is also you get too many is the opposite. And that, that has, funny enough, the same effect. If I don't know what to do after I've read the email, then I'm probably not going to do anything. I'm not going to like fight and make effort to ask. But then if there are too many, it's overwhelming and I'm not going to do any of them, which is also the same effect. So how many times do you see that? Well, I mean, I've, I've seen both. So I see some emails where people have you know two to three calls to action. You could be putting a phone number, um, an email, a LinkedIn, different things. But I've also seen a, you know, a funny story. I had a client once call me when, uh, when I owned Auto, when I was the CEO of AutoClose and owned it. And uh, he called me, he goes, I have to tell you, Sean, I'm getting a 0% conversion. I don't know why. Nobody is clicking on my email um, and i just not getting any calls. And then I read the actual email. This was early on when I was doing a, you know, wearing a lot of hats. And I actually called the client back and I'm like, well, that's because you actually have nothing to reply to. You have no question and you have no call to action. So they didn't even leave, you know, a phone number to call in, a Calendly. Um, you know, sometimes people want to use LinkedIn, whatever that call to action might be. It might be to fill out a form. Um, but I do see that people, A, just write the email to write the email without any follow-up. And then I see people that write, you know, three follow-ups or three calls to action where when you do a, when you ask for three different things, it's like, you know, me asking you all, can I have, you know, apples, oranges, and grapes? Well, you know, which one do you want? Um, you know, then you have to make the person think, oh, which call to action should I reply to? So I do think that people do have too many, but I also people that I do, pe- I do think people have not enough. I know apples, oranges, and grapes isn't your breakfast at, the, at this time of morning. I know that's not how you're rolling, but it's yeah, just I, the I know what you mean. <laughs> just the coffee. Or oh, Starbucks, never anything else. Yeah, I know what you mean. And I always see as well, which is um, like frustrating when you see that, like I always struggled with following up. I always kind of ran out of things to say, which is my personal Achilles heel. And I see like lots of reps have that too. They're kind of all enthusiastic at the start. We've got lots to say, loads of energy. And then like three of your emails or something like that. And we've ran out. But the problem is using those too many call to actions, but you're literally just killing another email. So for example, if I do send the case study, don't ask for anything else. If you send the case study, yeah. because you want them to read that, that's it. And then you will follow up and that's when you might engage in a conversation. So sending a case study might be one thing. You may also have a uh, click a link to book a call is sometimes what happens. You may also have a big question at the start, which is, so Sean, tell me about your go-to-market strategy. That's a bad question. It's too broad. But that's also something I have to make effort to reply to. That is the call to action is to tell you about the go-to-market strategy. Those, those three things in one email, like I'm not getting all of them done. No shot. Yeah. Probably not doing the question. It's too much. And also, why Why do I need to tell you? And then the book a link to have a call. If I don't want to have a call, I'm not doing that. And the case study as well. I mean, how long have I got to sit there and read it? Is it good? Way too much going on. So so that's yeah. that's that one. But what do you think about um, emails being too long, Sean? There's a lot of debate about length of email being yeah. maybe under a phone screen if you were to scroll or a certain number of words. I think I think it depends on who you're talking to. but um that, that's would, one of my five sort of big killers if, if you write a freaking essay that's a, that's a big one and, and i do think it's a big one i think i think the biggest problem is well there's two things there's too long of a subject line and then there's too long of a body paragraph uh the subject line you know as you just mentioned if you're on a mobile device you're only seeing the first three words so anything after three words that you say in your subject line the prospect's not even reading and that is because about 72 percent of people actually read their emails off their mobile device 
And it was probably during more during COVID, a little bit less now. Now your body paragraph, now you don't have to write everything in one email. Like your whole goal is to get them on the phone. So if you spill all your beans in that one email, what else are you going to have to talk about? So I always tell people that initial email should be between 75 to 125 words. Um, follow-up should be 50 to 75, but that's 75 to 125. You want to be very concise. You don't want to be salesy, but what you do want to do is make sure you're getting that pain or challenge that prospect is facing in that, um, in that length. Um, I, you know, personally, I don't have time to read a whole essay and I'm sure you don't either, Ollie. So, um, when you're writing more than 125 words, you've already probably lost the attention of the reader. So keep it short and concise. But I do have a question going back to what we were talking about before, Ollie. And this is something I've debated with people and I know my personal opinion. So I've always used Calendly. Well, back in the day, I used Calendly a lot as my call to action. Okay. And I got pushed back, you know, about a year in because I was using it. I was getting demos, demos. This is when we started off with articles. And I had people say, it's too informal. Like, why are you sending me your Calendly? You know, we should, we should be talking about what time we're going to meet. How do you feel about putting Calendly as the call to action? So we're going back to the first point, but before we go back to the length, but I wanted to get your input on that because that's something that's been debated is should you be using Calendly? For me, I've had people tell me not to, but I still do to this day because I really think it gives me a, it's my best call to action when I put in the email. Yeah, but I had to say the word, it depends, but um, I think it makes a big difference on who you're selling to and who you also listen to. So if I went on my LinkedIn feed and I was to talk about that or see posts about it, I guarantee everybody is thoroughly against it. Um, and I don't necessarily agree 100% with it, but I see where they're coming from. If I'm some random rep that you've never heard of, company you've never heard of, and you don't necessarily need what I'm selling potentially, like you can see a value prop, but you don't need it right now. Am I clicking on some link? Yeah. Probably not, but that's not to say it won't work. Um, I think where it makes a big difference is if you're selling to a bigger company like enterprises or you know, it's it's like that kind of mid-market sales game, you're selling high ticket um products, it's probably not. Especially I think if you're selling to like really technical people, like if you sell to a software company like us, we deal with these things all the time. So we're probably a bit more aware of that. And we see yep. it too much and it annoys us. And that's when it doesn't work. If you're selling to maybe technically laggard markets or uh, smaller companies, yeah, probably brilliant. They probably haven't seen yep. it too much. It's like sending a video to uh, like a manufacturing firm. They probably don't get sent videos ever. So therefore yeah. seeing a calendar is probably, oh, like, yeah, I do want to book a call. I'll just click because no nothing is more annoying. I've done it before. Uh, can you meet Tuesday at 2 p.m.? No, I'm busy that day. Uh, no, what about Thursday? No, I'm off on that day. Well, what about the following Monday? No, I, I'm fully booked that day. It's it's so annoying. So I think it really depends. But personally, my middle ground, just to be the guy on, guy on the fence here, say something like, how would be Tuesday at 2.30 next week? If not, maybe we could use my calendar here. And then that gives some sort of, I'm making an effort. You can say no. But alternately, let's not have a 20 email exchange to try and work out yeah. time because at the end of it, it's just not going to happen. So before we get to the next point, I have one more question. And this is something I was actually reading about yesterday. Um, and this is also another debate that goes on is in that sales email, you mentioned earlier the word follow up. You mentioned the word checking in You know earlier. Um, I know there's debates going around that you should never, ever, ever use those words in an email. What do you feel about that, Ollie? Did I say checking in? You did yeah. not, but I, but you said follow okay. up. Okay, in in your follow up, you can call it your follow up. I would never say that I am following up with you to yeah, the prospect. Exactly. Um, that just and put, there's nothing wrong with it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. You can say sometimes it's even good to say to your prospect, "Look, you're one of my target accounts, and therefore yep. I'm, I've researched you, and my message is now relevant because I have done that research." But following up just categorizes you as oh yeah it's a salesperson and people go oh it's a salesperson delete or hang up yep. or whatever else yep. it may be so as a like an association thing i don't want to give them that opportunity to discard me that quickly and then it's down to is my message relevant is my timing right is my you know assumptions correct based on what i know about that persona and that market all of those things can go wrong i don't need another thing that is kind of all my own fault i can eradicate that word and that's not a problem so not a big deal but um but a small thing you can do to help your replies
Strangely enough, we are in agreement on two things today, Ollie. We should actually have make sure this is recorded here today, okay? Because we are in agreement. We should on both right now. It's we're on a high. <laughs> okay, well, let's go to number three. All right. So, um, what do you think about selling the dream versus selling on pain points? Now, I think um, it doesn't matter which one you do. But it's about which one is more accurate and which one is more emotive. But that's quite difficult if you're selling a dream. So, for example, uh, I. Sometimes we we get sent things like, "Would you like to double your uh, sales this quarter?" And you're like, "Come on, like, duh, yeah, I would." But it's also disbelievable. Uh, that's just if we could do that, we're doing something really wrong. If we're not currently doing that, there's, there's something. It's not believable, right? But then if we heard, um, "We'd like to cut costs by twenty five percent and increase something by something percent," that's like a pain point because we're spending too much. But you know. How much is that really motivating you? And and in an email as well, when you don't have a long time to express that, you don't have the tone of my voice to express that, you don't have my body language to express that, you just have the words on the page. How much is that a problem uh, and which way should you look for? So, you know, the way I would look at it is it depends on who that email is going out to. If I'm the CEO of a company, I want you to sell me the dream. I want you to sell me, okay, I can decrease your costs. I can do this. I can double your revenue. But if I'm a director of sales, I want you to solve my pain points and my challenges. So I think, like you said, there's two different spectrums. You have the dream and the pain points. And I think depending on who you're talking to in the organization, who that decision maker is and what you're trying to sell, product or service, it's going to depend on who that person is. So again, the dream is the CEO. The pain points is, I would say, director or below. Okay. Does it depend on if you go up to bigger types of company? And then it might shift or or not really? Well, it will, that will shift if you go up because at the end of the day, you know, for example, you could go to a CRO, someone that's in charge of revenue, um, you know, or a CFO. CFO might be saying, okay, we have to keep our EBITDA here. Okay. So what you want to do with your EBITDA is you want to either decrease your costs or increase your revenue. So if, if I'm going to sell a dream, I'm going to say, listen, I can decrease your cost, but increase your revenue at the same time. That might be attractive to a CRO, CFO. To a manager, he's like, well, I don't really care about that. I just want my sales guys hitting quota. So tell me how I can get 50 more demos to my sales team. I don't care about the revenue. I want those demos because those demos will turn into the revenue. So that's the way I would look at it. And probably per function. So if you sent that to uh, an HR lead, um, I don't know how they receive it. Probably they're more risk averse, maybe. That's, yeah. the, that's sort of the way that that function works. Probably finance too. It's very risk averse. It's not particularly like creative in that sense, but a marketer probably you can sell them the dream. Um, unless yep. they're, they're looking to cost and things like that, uh, <laughs> get my words out, cut their costs because of, um, recession and things like that maybe, but yeah, probably it depends on the function quite a bit as well. So personas going in there. All right. I got, I got one more for you. I think this could be quite, quite interesting. I, I've seen quite a lot of these like new tactics at the moment. Um, the one that I seem to be getting is, um, well, there's two, actually. I think you, you've you been seeing this one. We keep getting invited to these like highbrow events that aren't really highbrow events. It's like, Sean, do you want to come to this Enterprise 100 Social Club Elite big CMO, um, CEO dinner where you're all going to exchange business cards and do build deals together? No. Um, how do I know that's real? Like, I keep getting all of these things that they're describing that and it, it's just not going to be like that. And the other one I'm getting is, um, hi, I'm reaching out on behalf of unnamed person who is my CEO. They've told me to reach out to you and to set up a meeting. And I'm like, I don't know who the company is, who you are, who they are, why. And they've even forwarded the initial email to make it look real. And I'm like, I, I don't like what what is what is this about? Why is this a tactic? Those those silly little gimmicks and tactics. I think they just. They might work on the off chance, but what they're doing is they're harming your future reply rates. Because once this fully doesn't work, you've got to come up with something else. So you might as well just stick to it from the beginning and do things right. But those things, I absolutely can't stand them. What ones have you seen? You must have seen a couple. So I kind of see the the first one you mentioned, but I see a little little bit of a twist. So what I've been getting, and this is for years, is I'll get a call from somebody and say, hey, I'm calling from, I'm not going to mention the, the company that does it to me all the time, but let's just say ABC Group. And, uh, we have, we have, you know, four people, four of our clients are really, really interested in your sales engagement tool. Um, 
And I'd like to, you know, invite you to New York. Um, we're going to have all of them at a little mastermind group or a little conference. Um, and I'd love you to meet them all. You'll be able to get all the business cards and all that. But they, what they do is they actually tell you that they have clients ready for you. But the funny thing is then I've questioned them on the call. I'm like, what does AutoClose do? And they don't even know. So what they're trying to do is get you and say, oh, we have clients ready for you. And the, the interesting thing is they don't tell you till the end. You're like, oh, it's in New York. Okay, perfect. I'll, I'll be in New York, you know, that weekend. I'd love to come. And they wait till the end and say, okay, it's $2,000 for you to come to the table um, just to, to meet these four people that are already primed and ready to sign up. So what they're doing is, and, and there's a, a company I'm not going to mention. Funny enough, the company that does it is actually also a client of ours at AutoClose because, uh, um, and they, and they've used AutoClose for it, but they really try and engage you to these events in certain states. Don't tell you till the end of the conversation that you have to pay $2,000 plus your own flight to come down there. And they don't really have enough actual prospect ready for you. That's one. The other thing I see, which is a terrible sales email, is the data companies sending you saying, hey, uh, I have a list of Vanilla Soft, AutoClose, HubSpot, and Salesforce users. Uh, I can get you this with exactly the job titles you need. Reach out. I get those all the time. Um, s- lately, they've been going right to this, my spam. So I'm guessing Google and Microsoft are catching on to them. But those are the two that I really see. But the one that um, I, with that, with the group setting and the clients they have ready, they actually do an email campaign, but they also do phone calls where they call you up and they try and talk to you on the phone about 10 minutes, tell you exactly who's ready. You know, they're in the manufacturing. They won't tell you the name, but they're in the manufacturing sector. They have this much budget. They're looking for your product. And then they say, come down to New York for $2,000 and we'll introduce you. So it's funny you say that. Um, I've had a load of the, they, they normally call it like users list. And you have no way of quantifying that it is actually a users list and that it's any way legal and that it's valid. But yeah, like Salesforce customers list. I just spam all of them. But the other one that you said, I've I've helped a company that did this like the legit way to do it. And yeah. I was surprised how badly it worked. So they had um what you call intent data, which is like these companies are looking at companies like you and the competitors and Googling them, engaging with them on social media, nice things. And yeah. you would be able to get the person. Like it was it was Sean at order close on Twitter asking Salesforce for pricing, for example. And and you could literally be as matter of fact to see that tweet if you wanted, if it was possible. They would show people that and they would say, like, here is the company and this is what happened. You know, there's 74 other contacts this week that we could show you that are similar to this. People just disregarded it because they didn't think it was real. Mm-hmm. And uh, I bet there's 99% of these things, like you just described, they're not real. But I, I do think it's kind of awkward if you had to, well, I would call this like we're drinking our own champagne if you're selling that way and that's your product. But I don't think that that particular one works for, for the reasons you said. It's kind of, oh, yeah, I've seen this before. And we get it from all the big um, like review yeah. sites and all those types of firms. They say, yes, the um, this company is looking at the, the Vanilla Soft page right now. And here is the director of sales' LinkedIn profile. And you're like, really? Like, wh- what am I going to do with that? Just hit them up and say, are oh, you actually looking? And they say no. Well, it's, the, it's the best, just, is, yeah, that's difficult. The, the best are those the review sites that send you and say, "Here's a list of companies that are interested in your product: IBM, Microsoft, Nvidia." And you're like, "Well, there's fifty thousand employees at each." Right. Like, who is it? And the review sites do that all the time. They're like, "We have exactly who's on your website," but like, they don't have the person. So, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Yeah. All right, so well, we agreed on too much. I think we should end it here before we fall out. How's that sound? Uh, it sounds good to me. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. This has been uh, another great episode. Thank you for everybody listening. Um, if you enjoyed the show today, don't forget to give us a five-star review wherever you're listening from and subscribe so you don't miss the next show. See you soon and uh, hope everyone is having a great 2023.